So, Father, we come to you now needing a word from you, God. We've gone through it all day, all this week. Had ups, had downs. And for some of us, we dragged ourselves into the, your house on today. We need to hear from you. So, God, take these lips of clay. Reduce me. Increase you. Let your word come forth, God with power and persuasion and we thank you now for what you're getting ready to do it's in your son jesus name that we pray let the saints of god clap their hands and give the lord some praise hallelujah hallelujah get your bibles let's go into the word of the lord this morning certainly we consider a privilege and an honor to be in his house on this morning we thank god for all that he is doing and all that he will continue to do he is a great god Hallelujah. We thank God for Sakasha being back in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Praying for her. Amen. 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 Listen, um, I want to finish this series on this morning called Change Your Story. One encounter with Jesus changes everything. I want you to grab your Bibles. Go to John, the 11th chapter verse number 17 through 34. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. John, the 11th chapter, verse number 17 through 34. There is a word from the Lord. John 11, verse number 17 through 34. If you have it, say amen. If you don't have it, just look at the monitors on both sides of the stage. The Bible says, now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Let's church say four days. Bethany, verse number 18, was near Jerusalem about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give it to you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life whoever believes in me though he die yet shall live he shall live and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die do you believe this look at your neighbor and say do you believe this she said to him yes lord i believe that you are the christ the son of god who is coming into the world when she had said this she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were, were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where? have you laid them they said to him lord come and see i want to preach and teach as a spirit should guide from this subject in mind dying to live dying to live dying to live there are two special Christological features in the gospel of John. First, there are seven miracles of Jesus that he records. 
But John does not call them miracles. John calls them signs. He calls them signs to emphasize the mighty acts rather than the nature of them. See, signs never exist for itself. A sign always points to something else. So the miracles of Jesus are signs, but they point to the identity and the deity of Jesus. But not only in John do we find seven signs that Christ performs, but seven claims of deity that Jesus proclaims. Our text this morning is the fifth of these seven descriptive I am statements that Jesus proclaims. And these I am statements are, the trans, are to transcend his humanity and expose Jesus' eternal nature as the son of God. Jesus uses the statement I am to allude to the covenant name of God where he uh, revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush where he said I am that I am. And these I am statements from Jesus in the gospel of John confirm the sufficiency of Jesus for every need in the human life. You will see over and over again, Jesus proclaims I am in the gospel according to John. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus even said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says, I am the true vine. But in our text, Jesus proclaims that he is the resurrection and the life. He, he does not say, I raise the dead, I perform the resurrection, but he says, I am the resurrection. It means that a person who dies can still live referring to eternal life in and with Christ. He, he does more than just give life. Jesus is life. And therefore, death has no ultimate power over him. I know it's early in the sermon, but tell somebody, you getting up from here and you will live. Uh, all right, that was the wrong neighbor because if it was the right neighbor, they would have broke out in the praise. Look at somebody else across the room, point your finger at him and say, you getting up from here. And you will live. I don't care how dead the situation may look in your life. God is going to raise you up so you can live. And I came to proclaim to somebody in 2023 you existed. But in 2024 you getting ready to live. I need all the people that got a little bit of life in here. That can open up your mouth and say I'm getting ready to live. Jesus is a journey's day away on the east side of the Jordan in a city called Perea. Jesus is intentionally in, low key, in a low-key place because of the threat on his life from the Jewish authorities. And then Jesus gets word that one of his dearest friends, I need y'all to hear this, is having a health crisis. Uh, Lazarus is sick and sliding downward at a rapid pace. So much so that his sisters have hit the panic button and have asked Jesus to come immediately and heal him Martha the oldest and Mary the youngest share a home with their brother Lazarus and they are close friends with Jesus because whenever Jesus was in town the Bible lets us know that he spent quite a bit of time at their home this friendship is so special that the sisters have no problem at all pressing on the friendship in this crisis because they figure that Jesus is only a day away from them and there should be no reason why he could not make haste before it was too late because after all friendship is not proven in times of convenience and comfortability true friendship is needed when a crisis arises and presence and support is needed overall I, I, I don't need you to be a true friend I don't need you to be a true friend when I have money and no problems <laughs> I, I don't need a friend that's only present when the 
benefits are flowing but absent when the trials come but I need a friend that when I get tried in the fire you don't mind the smoke I need a real friend that know how to stick closer uh, I know I need a real friend a ride or die that no matter what hell I go through I got somebody that'll ride with me no matter what I'm not ready yet I'll let y'all know and I need to know is there anybody in here that say I need some real friends up in here I'm tired of fake phony Negroes that sit up there and want to suck up your ass and eat up your food and want you to pay the bill and want you to take them out and want you to do for them but they can't be found when they when you going through and got the audacity to lead you on red when you catching hell the devil is a liar I got to have some real ride I die people that no matter what come and no matter what go you gonna stick with it no matter what But what ultimately, what we ultimately see is that the sisters would have to wonder what took Jesus so long to respond to their crisis regarding their brother. The disciples are going to be confused about Jesus' language of Lazarus. Because Jesus says at one point he's asleep. Then he says early in the chapter, no, nah, he ain't asleep, he dead. And, and what is this talk, Jesus, about being resurrected for the glory of God? That's what you said all before this text. But Jesus doesn't immediately respond to their request. In fact, he doesn't show up for a combined four days. Somebody say four days. This is troubling, ladies and gentlemen, because Jesus had brought people back to life after dying. But in this case, in these cases, it was it, when he brought them back to life, it was soon after they died. But if Jesus would have left when they told him about Lazarus, he would have only been dead two days. But the Bible says he waited four days. So, so why did he wait four days to go see about Lazarus? Because Jew, Jewish mysticism teaches that a deceased person's spirit remains around the body for up to three days after death before departing. It, it was well known in Israel 2,000 years ago that someone who died could come back to life during these three days, but not after those three days. They believe that on the fourth day, somebody say the fourth day. The spirit left the body and there was no hope for life without a miracle. And to make matters worse, by the fourth day in Israel's hot climate, advancing decay, advanced decay would be destroying the body and a stench would have been overwhelming. Why did you wait four days? I asked the text. Why, Jesus, did you wait four days? And God said, because sometimes I have to wait until a situation is dead enough that when he resurrects it, nobody but him will get the glory okay some of you are sitting here wondering why God has not come through for you yet but I've come to let you know that maybe it's because it ain't dead enough yet he waited in order to show something to his disciples that would glorify God even more than all the other miracles he had already demonstrated he shows them that he has power over sickness power opening up blinded eyes power over raising the lame power over casting out demons and God is trying to show you and I that I can still resurrect your dead situation no matter how dead it's been no matter how long it's been dead I came to tell somebody God said I can still resurrect your family I can still resurrect your dream I can still resurrect your reputation and it doesn't matter how dead it is I am the resurrection and the life and whoever believes in me though he is dead yet shall he live is there anybody in here that got enough faith to believe God can still resurrect that wayward child. God can still resurrect my jacked up family. God can still resurrect my future. God can still resurrect my situation. I need to know is there anybody in here that believes in the resurrection power of God? And what I saw in this text is not only did Jesus wait for Lazarus to be dead enough to resurrect him, but there were some other things in this text. That, that needed to die so that life could happen. I would argue with you that Lazarus is the only thing in this text that needed to die. There were some other things that needed to die. 
And the question became, I know I didn't put it on the screen. Is it on there? Y'all got it on yet yet? Thank you. What must die in my life so that I can live? <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you came on the right Sunday. <laughs> what must die in my life so that I can live? Lazarus wasn't the only thing that needed to die. There was some other stuff I saw in the text. Are you interested this morning? What, what must die in my life so that I can live? Here's number one, your unwillingness to wait. It's getting quiet. Your unwillingness to wait has to die. <laughs> Ooh, the text says that Martha heard that Jesus was coming. She went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus when she got to him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Now, I'm not upset with her because I can imagine the mental anguish that Martha had to endure wondering what took Jesus so long to get to them. Jesus, hey, 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 did you not understand the severity of the situation? I, I sent word. Did you not understand how sick Lazarus was? What, 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 what could have made you delay for that long? I, I, I mean, I mean what, why, why, why such the holdup? I text you days ago. You ain't called me back yet. I, I, call, I, I called you a long time ago. You ain't reached out to me yet. H have, you, have you ever looked at your own life and asked yourself, what's taking Jesus so long? I ain't got no real people. Can I talk to some real saints that ever had to ask? I know you speak in tongues. I know you shout. I know you sing on the choir. You usher on the board. You a deacon. You a preacher. You all that. But have you ever had to ask Jesus, what's taking you so long? I've been praying, I've been giving, I've been waiting on the Lord to come through for me, but what's taking you so long? I can imagine Martha questioning the relationship she had with Jesus because maybe huh, we should not have thought that you loved us as much as we thought you did because if you really loved me, you would have showed up for me. And don't you fool yourself. Because Martha ain't the only one. Cause, because anytime someone is not there, the thought that why weren't you there makes you question, is the relationship even real? <laughs> Am I talking to any real people in this house? I mean, it makes you question, is the, is the relationship even real? Because your responses are delayed. When your responses are delayed in any relationship, it can create something called relational anxiety. Come here, I'm talking to you. You fell out with your family because they weren't there for you like you thought they should. You fell out with your friends because they didn't respond quick enough to your issue. You fell out with the church. Because you thought that the church would support you in a way that you didn't receive. And when the relational anxiety sets in, what creeps in with it is feelings of doubt, insecurity, and worry. Making you guarded with the person so that you can protect yourself from any future hurt or preemptive difficulties. You are mad and upset and now you're questioning. When you said you love me, did you really love me? Because if you really love me, you would have been there. If you really love me, you would have supported me. If you really love me like you're Say you love me and now emotional anxiety is setting in relational anxiety has taken root in your heart and now you questioning everything you're looking cross-eyed at them they gave you the wedding that you wanted they gave you the ring that you wanted you walked down the aisle with that ugly wedding dress on you took them old ugly pictures and now because he didn't come through the one time that you thought he was supposed to come through now you questioning everything like it was all a lie it didn't make no sense at all it was what you lying to me then or you lying to me now no boo you just got relational anxiety where you're questioning everything you're second guessing it that's why uh-huh i'm coming to you that's why some of us have stopped praying because you were trying to guard yourself from the disappointment of any more unanswered prayer that's why you leave it to everybody else to pray for you but you won't pray for yourself because you're tired of being disappointed by god but what martha teaches us is that the only way you can get 
get ahead of relational anxiety is you got to express your feelings by having an honest conversation. If you would have been there, my brother would not have died. I let go of the anxiety when I can be honest and tell him how I really feel. Is there anybody in here that say, I'm too old to play the game any longer. I'm too old to sit around here with my mouth shut. I'm going to let it all hang out and say how I really feel. Because if we're going to deal with it, let's deal with it. It's getting tight. Old preacher said it's tight, but it's right. The power of her statement was not in, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. The power of her statement was in verse 21 when she says, but even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give it to you. I came to tell somebody, look over at your neighbor because they tired of me. Say, neighbor, in the midst of anxiety, don't you lose your faith. You got to believe that it ain't over for you. You got to believe that there's more that God can do. I came to talk to somebody that was walking around anxious, questioning yourself, questioning your life, questioning God, thinking that God ain't gonna come through for you. I need you to muster up a little bit of faith and still say, I believe God. Oh, I don't know how it's gonna happen. I don't know how it's gonna come through, but is there anybody in here that can give God just a little bit of praise and tell God, I still trust you in the midst of it what must die your unwillingness to wait watch this let me reframe waiting let me reframe waiting because I don't like to wait on the Lord you don't like to wait well you're more saved than me and so you like to wait on the Lord but I don't like to wait on the Lord I get, I get anxious I get antsy I get restless I want him to come through a whole lot quicker than how he's coming through I mean I've been praying about this thing for a long time I ain't talking about them little prayers you know y'all pray for something for about two days then you ain't thinking about it no more I'm talking about I've been waiting on God to do some stuff for a long time and it seemed like he ain't coming through let me reframe waiting see if you look back over your life you can identify times when God could have intervened for you but did not you can think of times that he could have changed things yet for some reason we can't understand he didn't change nothing and if we be honest just think back for a minute it was in those times that we had a mixture of faith with a mixture and a measure of reproach so on one end I had faith in him on the other end I was mad at him but always remember the rest of the story touch your neighbor say remember the rest of the story because when you realize that he works all things together for your good then you can let your faith grow and let your reproach grow go I came to find out is there anybody that say I'm still going to wait on him even though it haven't happened yet I'm still going to wait on him I got a little bit of faith you still don't believe it wait on the Lord and be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart wait I say on the Lord but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint the Lord is good to those who wait for him to whose soul seeks him trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path touch three people around you say wait on him wait on him wait on him wait on him I need somebody here to say I'm waiting on something that's why I can praise him before it happens I'm waiting on something that's why I can lift him up before he comes through I'm waiting on something and I'm going to wait until my change comes I'm going to wait until he opens the door I'm going to wait until he makes the way what must die in my life so that I can live number one my unwillingness to wait but here's the second thing that got to die before I can live your God forsaken grief your 
your God, I feel the Holy Ghost, your God forsaken grief. I mean, the text, the Bible says that Martha confronts Jesus, then musters up a little bit of faith, and Jesus lets her know your brother will rise again. Martha says, listen, I know he's going to rise again in the resurrection on the last day. It was a statement of eschatological exactness, but discouraging disappointment. I'm disappointed now, waiting on a celebration later. Everybody can't get this. Jesus, how you want me to reconcile that? You want me to be disappointed now, waiting on some great getting up morning. Fairly well, fairly well. You, you, you want me to be, be disappointed now, waiting on some glad morning. When this life is over, I'll fly away. Jesus, how can I deal with the grief I carry now? Because, because that's where some of you are right now. You're, you're grieving. Uh, and this, um, let, me, let me be clear. Let me, clear. let me be clear. Grieving is not always about somebody dying. Grieving is a response to loss, not just death. <laughs> There's some of you that you can't give God no praise because you are grieving a loss of an opportunity. You, you, you are grieving a loss of a relationship because grief is a response to loss. And see, if you're not careful, watch this, the enemy will use your grief as an entryway, catch this, to set you back emotionally. I'm talking to you. Uh, 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 the enemy uses your grief as an open door to get in there and set you back emotionally because grief is an indication that you loved something. And that love is the door to your hearts. Jesus, let me teach this. The enemy is after the door to your heart because it's behind that door that your faith can be robbed. Oh my God. Uh huh, uh huh. It's behind that door that your joy can be stolen. It's behind that door that your peace can be taken. And when you and I are set back emotionally, that means we are detoured mentally. And if we're detoured mentally, then we are stopped physically. Some of you haven't been begun living past 2019 because everything that happened to you in 2019 has shut you down to the place where you've been dead emotionally ever since oh my god but I came to announce to somebody this morning no more setbacks in 2024 I'm gonna press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling which is in Christ Jesus I came to announce to somebody touch somebody around you and tell them no more setbacks in 2024 Four. Ah, that was the wrong neighbor. Reach and shake somebody's hand like you're going to shake it off and say no more setbacks in 2024. For these light afflictions are but for a moment compared to the eternal glory that awaits you. I'm going to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. My feet are getting light because I'm going after what God is Why no more setbacks? Why no more setbacks? Because you can't keep revisiting what you cannot revive. Something you lost has taken an emotional impact on you. But the impact doesn't have to impede you. It hurts but you've got help. It was disappointing, but you got deliverance. And if you could just muster up a little bit of faith this morning and believe God again, God says, I can open the door again and set back in your heart what needs to be there. If you would have been here, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. See, if you come out of regret, God can orchestrate a recovery. 
Brother Pastor, that sounds real good, but how do I recover emotionally? I'm so glad you asked me. How do I recover emotionally? How do I co recover emotionally? I'm so glad you asked me. Uh, you asked me because you're a good church and you're paying attention to the message. You really want to know. You want to figure this out. How do I recover emotionally? It's all wrapped up in one word. You ready? Here it is. Acceptance. Let church say acceptance. Okay, okay. Some of us are in God-forsaken grief because we haven't accepted the reality of what's taking place. Trying to revive something that can't be revived. <laughs> oh God. I have to cultivate acceptance. Watch this by noticing my resistance. When I realize what I'm resisting, then it can lead me to a place of acceptance. See, what I'm resisting, that, uh, what I'm resisting is actually killing my faith. See, let's, can we talk? Can we talk? Can we talk? We finna have real grown, the children downstairs, let's have real grown up talk. Let's have real grown, grown up talk. The quicker I accept that I'm not that age anymore. The quicker I accept we not together anymore. The quicker I accept that season is over. The quicker I accept, watch this, they moved on without me. The quicker I accept they did me wrong, the quicker I accept I played the fool, the quicker I can accept I made the mistake, the quicker I can accept I can, the quicker I accept it, I can move into what God has for me next. And the reason ain't because God ain't showering down blessings. It's your inability to accept what has already happened. And I need somebody in here just to realize it happened. I learned from it. I grew from it. It didn't kill me. I'm still here. I'm a survivor. I'm not going nowhere. I got breath in my body. I'm still anointed. I still called of God. And just because it's over, it is not over for my life. I am accept it look at somebody say that man teaching today he is teaching today that is why Paul says we don't weep as others weep but we have as if we have no hope Paul says we don't weep like other people weep we don't, we don't weep. We don't, we, don't, we don't carry on like other people carry on. That's why you can tell the difference between when you come to a funeral and you can see the saved and the unsaved. Because the saved might cry a tear, but they still got a praise down in their belly. Because they realize that absent from the body is present with the Lord. Now when you ain't got no hope, you falling all out. You trying to get in a casket with them. But when you realize that God, if God be for me, who can be against me? I got some hope and it means I grieve differently. See, when I process the pain of the present without losing my hope of the future, you know what it happens? Touch your neighbor, say neighbor, I want to preach this to you. Better days are ahead of you oh my god i don't know who i'm talking to but i came to announce to somebody that better days are ahead of you i need you to give god just a little bit of praise if you believe that better days are ahead of you open up your mouth and give god glory like you believe better days better days are ahead of me Better days are ahead of me. Better day, I don't care what happened in my past. Better days are ahead of me. I need somebody, get out your row. Go touch somebody and tell them, better days are ahead of you. Shake them by the hand. Say, better days are ahead of you. I don't care what it looks like. Better days are ahead of me. I might cry a little bit, I might weep a little bit, but weeping may <laughs> endure for a night, <laughs> but oh joy, it's coming in the morning, cause better days are ahead.
Linda, better days are ahead of you. Middleton, better days are ahead of you. Sakesha, better days are ahead of you. Kiara, better days are ahead of you. I came to tell somebody, better days are ahead of you. Give God a praise like you believe better days are ahead of you. Can I go ahead and bust this up real quick? Let me bust this up real quick. The devil thought what you went through last was going to be your last opportunity and was going to take you out. But I need you to defy the devil just for a minute and open up your mouth and say what you meant for evil. God, turn it around for my good and better days. All right. What's, what's got to die in my life so that I can live? Number one, my unwillingness to wait. Number two, my God-forsaken grief. I ain't grieving like everybody else. I'll cry for a minute, but better days are ahead of me. But here's number three, and I'm done. Your unmet expectations. What has to die in 2024? For you to live your unmet expectations. Your unmet expectations. The Bible says that Jesus deals with Martha. And Martha goes. I need y'all to surround her right now. I feel that coming off of her. 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 I felt that right there, 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 right there. And he will restore unto you the joy of your salvation. He will restore unto you. Come on, I feel God moving right now. I need you to open up your mouth. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I need somebody to open up your mouth. There's a glory that's here. There's a glory that's here. And if you can tap in, you can get it as well. Open up your mouth. Come on, come on through. Come on through. Let that break off of you. There's somebody else in here. That grief has been plaguing you all the last couple of years. I need you to open up your mouth. God has interrupted the schedule for you to get delivered from that thing. You get ready to get your joy back. You get ready to get your peace back. You get ready to get your smile back. Open up your mouth. The water is troubled. There's some of you in the sound of my voice that have been living in a state of grief. Your heart has been broken. Your heart has been broken and the enemy came in at the very moment your heart was broke because your love was attached to something. I don't know who I'm talking to 
but if I'm talking to you, I don't need you to pay attention to nobody. Get up out your seat and meet me on this altar. Move now. <laughs>